Welcome to another episode of DD on the Spot. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Johnson. Before we get into it with our guests, well, first of all, I know it's been two years. It's been basically like actually two and a half years since we last had her on, but we have Jennifer Reese back on. And I, we were just talking about this right before we started recording that it's just so funny that I had her on in February of 2020, everyone. So I had her on right before COVID, you know, just ruined everyone's lives and was just an entire mess that that was. So it's always funny just it's funny, at least for me, just looking back at that and being like, wow, it's been like two and a half years since I since I talked to her. And it was right before, you know, the whole world went upside down. But, yeah, she's on again and, you know, on here to share her journey with us and what she's been up to. And, yeah, Jennifer, thank you so much for coming back on. I'm so happy to be here. Well, I ask this to every single guest, no matter how many times I get crap for it. What is the weather like today? I haven't really been outside except to go do my cardio this morning, but it's actually kind of nice out, so. which is Good, because Fort McMurray in October, especially towards the end, it's pretty much winter, so we haven't had any snow yet, which is awesome. I forgot. She's a Canuck, everyone. I, for, I totally forgot <laughs> about that. I didn't, I, I honestly, like, I I did a little bit of background research before I have, like, a second guess on, like, I'll go, I'll scroll through their photos and look through some stuff just to make sure that, like, they're still alive and stuff, but, like, yeah, <laughs> literally, so, yeah, I, I totally forgot that she's up there, so, yeah. Anytime, especially, I mean, being from Minnesota myself, anytime, you know, you can go out for uh, your cardio that means that the weather must not be, you know, that terrible. But, but I mean, I know we're all going to be in a deep depression. Me and you are probably going to be in a deep depression in about two months. So I don't want to dive too far into that because, you know, <laughs> winter is coming, unfortunately. But yeah, I mean, it's been two and a half years since I last had you on right before COVID. I mean, what has this last two and a half years been like for you? You know what? It's it's been weird. I and mean, I know it's been weird for everybody. Um, but it's just time is, I don't know, it, it's gone quickly but it's also gone so slowly but not that much has happened it's like we kind of lost a couple of years so uh i was trying to get ready for shows and and they just kept getting canceled and postponed and blah 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 and then i've actually managed to do i'm just getting ready to do my fifth show since we talked last but it was like nothing happened and then bang 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 everything kind of kind of got back to normal so that's good how did you deal with everything mentally? Because as soon as everything started to shut down, I'm like, oh my God, the bodybuilders that have on the podcast, they're going to need some extra help because it, with your, I mean, just the personality, like you have to go to the gym. You have to find ways to work out. A lot of them, I found it funny that a lot of gyms became like speakeasies where it's like, you know, you just had to know someone and then they let you in on hours when you even weren't supposed to be in there. But how did you deal with everything like that mentally? Because that was, especially for people that, I mean, your lifestyle is that you're out and about and around people most of the time. How did you deal with that? Um, you know what, I, well, like I said, I was trying to prep for different shows, but I, I just took a break. Um, and so that was nice. I, I did kind of just let myself off the hook and, just, you know, not worry about it too much. Uh, I did what I could, but there was a lot of time where, you know, you just couldn't do much of anything. So, um, I don't, didn't want to like try to keep put pressure on myself and beat myself up about it and get down about it so I just kind of took a break and I kept my eye on different shows and what was coming up um what might happen and just trying to you know look towards the future and and know that like that's the other thing is it wasn't just me I had to remind myself like it was difficult for everybody so it's like if you alone were going through that problem and like or a problem and couldn't compete couldn't get to a show but they were all still happening that would be one thing but it was kind of everybody was in the same boat so it was just almost like everything was on hold so it it wasn't for me personally too too bad and then as soon as I could I got back into competing so and I love that you mentioned that like most people it really just made more people aware of that like everyone has joint suffering with a lot of things in life because I too was in that thing where like when I was locked down and doing everything like I forgot that like everyone else was in that same phase and then when I was you know having FaceTimes with some friends and then I realized that like yeah everyone's in the same boat it made me feel actually a little bit more better about the whole situation where I was like okay well everyone's dealing with this so it's not like yeah it's not like I was the one person that got like a flu or something like that. And I had to miss out for like, I mean, it's like, yeah, it's like everyone had to do that. So I think that helped me at least out myself mentally, but I mean, getting ready for preps and then having shows canceled and just going through that whole thing. How did you deal with that aspect? Because for me, like getting into a prep shape takes so much hard work and dedication. And then to find out like some of the guests I had on, they found out literally like maybe a week out that like, Oh yeah, the show's got canceled. And I just can't imagine just putting in all that hard work and then realizing like, Oh, I'm not able to like show this work off. And it was all not all for nothing, but like it was all just, just for the prep, I guess. 
Well, right. I, I, I was lucky that I kind of kept my eye ahead. So, like, I never got to the six-week mark. So, at six weeks, you're pretty much, it's go time. You know, because things start to change, you get a lot more intense kind of at that point. So, as long as you're not really up to that point, you can kind of pivot and kind of up and down. I find, anyway, fairly easily. Um, but don't get me wrong, it was still very frustrating. And... I mean, in hindsight, if I could go back and I knew those shows were going to happen, would I? I would have just taken a bigger rest and tried to, you know, look at it more like an off season instead of trying to prep. But um, you know, it, it was still it wasn't a horrible experience or anything like that. But it, I was lucky because if it was a week out, and, and I actually had a friend who was doing uh, an amateur show in Toronto, and they moved the show three times, and he was bouncing around, and then the show got canceled the night before he had his tan on and everything like that. I might not have handled as well. <laughs> so you know that that's devastating. Oh, for me, there would have to be blood on the streets then. Yeah, if that happened, if I got that prepared and then the night before they're like, oh no, I was like, well, you know, we're going to have to fix this some way then. But yeah, that is, that is crazy. I cannot imagine what must go through your mind at that. But I mean, it's been two and a half years and I love to ask this to even guess that I've, you know, taken a year to have in between podcasts. But what do you think is one area of your body that you've improved on the most since we last had you on? Um, you know what? I've made a lot of improvements since we were on. I'm actually very happy with the work that I've done and I'm proud of myself for it. Um, since we've talked last, a lot of things have changed for me, um, just with coaches and, and obviously COVID. Um, but I've, I've had three different coaches that I've worked with since we talked last. And like I said, I'm getting ready to do my fifth show. I've brought up my my legs, my glutes, my hamstrings, my shoulders, um, been working on my back, which I think I brought up to you. I would say most notably my shoulders for the last show, which was in July. And now I've been focusing on uh, my glutes and my quad sweep for the show that I have coming up. So, but I think it's a drastic difference since we talked last. Like, well, I love to like, also bring up coaching now too. And it's like, you've been through three in this, that little span. I, I ask this question now because for everyone, a different has different answers for it because I mean, a coach. Some people like coaches, or some people like a certain coach. Some people don't like them. It's all about you know what a coach does for you. I compare it to like being a teacher, where if you scold one student, they might like need it and that and that helps them like get better. And then you scold that say a same a yeah tongue tied twisted moment. Everyone's going on the blooper reel, but then okay, so in three, two, one. But then you scold another student, and then it just like tears them apart, and then. You know, yeah. it's just, it's, it's pick your poison really. But in your opinion, what makes a coach really a good coach? Because unfortunately, in my experience of talking to so many people, I think there's for every good coach, there's a, there's more bad coaches. So it's really hard for a lot of people to just find that one person that really connects with them. Yeah. Well, and you make a good point because some people work better with uh, positive confirmation and affirmation that they're doing well and blah 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 and other people well you know like you said if you, they work more towards the negative so if you scold them and you're like come on you, you want to lose da, 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 they're going to work harder so you have to find someone that that relates to you how you it, take information in and then th that's how they work with you but um for me i find a, a good coach is someone that's paying attention someone that's like i don't need uh, i don't consider myself a high maintenance athlete i don't need a lot of coddling or whatever i'm i i don't need it's, it's great if your coach becomes your friend but a lot of those relationships don't necessarily start off that way it's a, it's a business relationship you're paying for a service but and then you know you develop a relationship over time um if it's a, if it's the right fit but I, I think they need to be paying attention as long as I feel like, cause, because you're putting your full trust in someone. So you have to trust that they're going to do what's in your best interest. And that they're also paying attention to you because obviously they have, they have a lot of athletes. Um, most of the coaches, the top coaches do. So you have to be able to trust that you're getting um, the right feedback for you. You know, that they're not just going, yeah, do this, do that. And they're telling everybody, all of their athletes or a majority of them pretty much the same thing, you know, and then they're not, they're going to be paying attention enough to not put your health at risk too, right? So, I mean, that's partially on the athlete to decide what they're willing to do and what they're willing not to do. And, and you have to take responsibility for your own health, but you also have to trust 
that the coach is, is taking that into consideration as well. Like when you need a break, that they're going to be able to identify that. And I say that just because that's what literally just happened to me last week, you know, um, where my coach identified that my body wasn't responding and I didn't even realize I was tired and my body was inflamed and that I was pushing too hard. And he said, okay, dial it back for a couple of days. Okay, now you're good. And we're right back on track. So to me, he's paying attention, you know, even more in tune with what's happening with me than I am sometimes. Well, you mentioned that like you were pushing things way too hard and I'm one person myself too, that at times I can't really judge when I'm going too far when it comes to even my like physical exertion, where is just, just the whole athlete in me where there've been times where, you know, someone might tell me, Oh, like you're not, you got more left in you, but do you still obviously like struggle with times that you might be pushing yourself too hard and you don't really know where that limits reach? Because especially in this sport where limits can be somewhat blurry to a lot of people, how do you sort of, I mean, obviously having a good coach is a great answer too, but are there other ways that you help to try to help yourself, like realize that like, oh, hey, maybe, maybe my body isn't responding. Maybe I'm pushing things too hard. Yeah, you, I, I think that's something that you learn over time, uh, how to listen to your body. I always make the comparison. It's like buying a Honda Civic and souping it up. And, you know, now you've got to put premium gas in it. You've got to pay attention to it. You've got to do the tunes because now you've got to fine tune the machine. So if you, fine tune it and you listen to it properly it will tell you what you need to know um and you just have to learn how to listen to it and really be in tune with that because there's going to be days where especially in prep where you think oh, i gotta go you know you've, you've got all this drive and i gotta go i gotta give it i gotta get 110 percent. i gotta work harder than the next person but working hard is not necessarily working working yourself to the to the death you know what i mean working hard sometimes it's hard to take the day off it's hard to know okay i need to go for a massage i need to just lay in the bath and watch a movie tonight da, 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 and not you're not going to be any further ahead by pushing 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 because it's your body's like a car it's the it's the the most complicated and the most amazing machine that you will ever own right so you have to learn how to operate it properly it's not just put your foot on the gas and go, go, go until it burns out. So it's, it's tricky, but like you learn, you know, over time, how to, how to really be in tune with that. Well, part of the whole recovery thing is nutrition. I mean, if you're eating the right foods, that helps as well, but how has your nutrition changed over the last two and a half years? Oh, drastically also. So, um, I eat a lot more now. I'm a lot happier. <laughs> Preps are a lot more fun. Um, I, I put on some muscle and like, so I can eat more. I have an amazing coach. I'm working with Hyacinth and Nasser now. And he, like my last whole prep was our first prep together. And we're doing this one now. I never go over 30 minutes of cardio. My calories are still, I don't know what they're exactly, but they're still pretty high. high. I'm eating my carbs. I'm happy. My weight's coming down. Like my nutrition is on point. Um, I've always been one to be able to do, to work the meal plan. I'm not like a diet cheater. I'll do what I'm told. But I used to run on fumes, like eating air sandwiches, like in stones, like, you know, ice cubes for dinner. And now life is a lot, a lot better. So I find, and it's not that my old other coaches didn't know what they were doing. It's just, you know, there's just certain levels to things. And, and I love my, my previous coach then all of them, but, um, you just, as I find as you get more advanced, you get coaches that are higher level and, and are afraid to feed you more. You can, you can really, it's amazing how much you can actually eat and still burn. You know, when, once you understand how your body works or they understand what, how much they can feed you, it's really, it's a lot different. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. There are different tiers of coaches when it comes to knowledge and experience. I mean, I compare it to like elementary, middle, high school and college teachers. I mean, they all have different experiences. They're all going to, you don't know different things. So yeah, obviously there's not one person that knows it all, but there are more experienced people out there. And yeah, it's just, it's all about finding that right match, which is, you know, that is 75% of the journey of at least what I've heard on this podcast of people just yeah. finding that out. So. And different strengths. All coaches have different strengths. Well, we can see the shoulders now, everyone. Good God. So yeah, that, that that's definitely an area that's improved. So yeah, that is ridiculous. So yeah, there is that, but yeah, different yeah. strengths and weaknesses for everyone. And, you know, it's all about finding them and, you know, fine tuning them as well. And 
Yeah. yeah. How would you say that this prep, this last prep that you've done has differed from all the other preps? Because every little prep, I think, just has little tiny differences in them. Well, this prep was interesting because I did the Vancouver show in July. And like I said, that was my first uh, full time, like my first full prep with Hyacin. And so I said to him after the show, you tell me, you're the boss, I trust you 100%. Do you want to do another show? Do you want to do an off season? What do you think my body needs? What do you think I need? How, you know, where are we going to be best suited to put our efforts? And he said, nope, let, let's pick another show. So he gave the time frame, and uh, we picked the show. So we're doing Romania in four weeks, which I'm super excited about. But because we came from one show to the next, which I've never done, it was a full 17 weeks. So we almost did like a mini off season, which I've never really done before. So that was a new experience for me because it was coming fully out of prep, but not into a full like dumpster diving, you know, trash panda off season (laughs) type thing. It was just more food. So it was interesting mentally to get wrap my head around um, coming out of prep, getting to eat a whole bunch more food and and not gaining a whole bunch of weight and staying relatively lean. And then now we're just, we're tapering down on the last, you know, four weeks. So it, that was a whole new experience for me because I've either gone back to back shows where I was in hardcore prep for a really long time on really low calorie, really difficult mentally um, or, one extreme to the other show straight like to off season so this was kind of a whole mini in between that i didn't really i mean logically knew existed but had never experienced wait so you're going to like romania the country yeah yeah more power to i mean that's that's right that's bordering ukraine right there so i don't know if i'd go there right now but hey you know more power to you for doing that (laughs) yeah i know i i know it's it's awful that that's going on um, is it your first, I, is, is it going to be your first time in Europe competing? Yes. It's my first time in Europe, period. I've always wanted to go visit the homeland in Norway. One of these one of these summers I'm going to have to eventually do it, but yeah, I've always wanted to do that myself. I've always wanted to go and travel Europe. I, my older brother did it and he loved it and you're going to be doing that. Have you already been like looking at like maybe what kind of food options? I mean, obviously they're going to have like a lot of, you know, like you know, American foods there, but are you still kind of like looking around for like hot spots to eat at? I haven't done that yet. <laughs> I've talked to a few people that I know here that are actually from Romania. I, I'm unfortunately not going to be able to stay for too long. Um, I'm meeting uh, Tanya Chartrand. I think uh, she's been on your show before. So she's doing the show. Her and I are, are really, really good friends. So uh, we're going to stay two days after and kind of eat a bunch of stuff and go see some castles and some cool stuff, but we don't have a lot of time to, to do that. So I haven't like found all the hot spots. Oh see. yeah. That's the only reason I go to Romania. The historian me is to see all the castles because yeah, they have so many freaking castles in Romania. It's yeah, I, that, that would be, that would be very, very cool for me. So yeah, yeah. That, is, that is something, you know, at least to, you know, be excited for, but we talked about, you know, cardio last time. Has your relationship with cardio changed as you put on more size or is it still, you know, just the, the bane of a lot of bodybuilders' existence? No, my cardio, like, that's what I mean. This is, we've, we've talked, like, li- literally, I think almost everything that I've done and I've been doing is different. Um, I used to be doing 45 minutes cardio in, in the morning, 45 minutes at night. That was pretty standard prep for years. Um I've never done more than 30 minutes in the morning for the last, like, well, since I started working with Hyacin, either five to seven days a week. Uh, right now, obviously it's seven days a week. Um, so I love it because 30 minutes is nothing. And I mean, I don't, I don't mess around. It's not 30 minutes of like sauntering on the treadmill. It's like, I can get in there 30 minutes, bang it out, give it 110% and then it's over. And that is lucky. Yeah, it's great because I've never been that type of person that I, or whatever, my body, I wasn't doing the right things or giving it the right things where I had to do more cardio. And that's what coaches had me doing. But with him, it's just, nope, we've never, I think maybe twice he had me do 40 minutes for like a couple of days. 
back in June. But no, it's but it's great because that way you, you, you keep the size, you keep the fullness, and you're not run down, and you have I have way better workouts because I'm in the gym for less time because my workouts are all completely different now too. So my cardio is shorter. So I'm not as tired. I can get a good day in at work. Then I go straight back to the gym. My workouts are faster. So I sleep more. I eat more. I do less cardio. I'm, I'm a way happier person. <laughs> well, give me what she's having, everyone. I mean, because, geez, I think I need a little bit more happiness in my life itself. But let's just go down the checklist then. So how have your workouts been different? Because you mentioned that your workouts have been different as well. Yeah, so with Hyacin, he's had me doing uh, push-pull legs. So I always did a kind of row split or variation of, you know, someone hit legs twice a week or back twice a week, whatever. But now it's push-pull legs, push-pull legs. Um, and I only have, as with shoulders, I have one-minute rest in between sets. So it's, I'm moving. I'm, there's no talking. The whole workout is timed, which is great because I don't, you know, spend time socializing at the gym until after I ruin other people's workouts. They don't ruin mine anymore. <laughs> um, Cause I'm like the timer at the timer. I gotta keep going. <laughs> but um, yeah. And then I do two minutes rest for back and legs and it's just, it's in, get in, get it done, get it done well, and then get out. I wish and more people, I wish more people did time workouts. They seem like they're so much more effective. I've tried them myself and I, they work for me as well, but I just wish that was more mainstream where like everyone did that because it's it's so much – I think the time goes by quicker and also you get more stuff done because you're just really focused on just getting that stuff done as opposed to like – like you're talking about socializing maybe accidentally for like five, ten minutes with someone then and totally like throwing you off sync. Yeah, and that's the thing. Like a lot of people take way too much rest time in between sets and that's what drags your workout out. You know, and right now I've been doing the same workout since January or February, um, which – is getting a little bit boring now, but it's that whole, um, the same exercises, you're just getting better at them and better at the hammering away at the muscle in the same way. So it's just responding, you know, versus the whole, um, we're going to do different exercises, different this da, 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 all the time, which is also good for certain things. But this way I find it's really good for, for steady, like, growth and strength improvements and speed and everything. So, I mean, yeah. obviously it seems like your time management has gotten a lot better as well. Has there been anything else that you've been able to enjoy now with maybe that little extra bit of time now that you have to not be focusing on bodybuilding? Um, I nap a lot. No. <laughs> I thoroughly enjoy my naps. Um, no, you know what? I, I mean, you know, I live up, in Fort McMurray in the middle of nowhere. So there isn't really too much to do. My whole, what I love to do is travel. So I, I do that whenever I can. Um, but as far as like downtime during, through, during the day, I do a, listen to a lot of podcasts and, you know, read and motivational stuff. And I always get into different people um, and their guests and stuff. So I, I would say it's not physical self-work in the gym. It's mental self-work that I'm doing. Oh, yeah, like you're only in there for like maybe an hour a day, but you're in your own head for, you know, 16 hours, depending on how much sleep you get. So, yeah, that's the most that's the most underrated value of anything really in your life is you got to get the mental side of it done right first. And believe me, I know I know that myself more than most people. But, yeah, it's it is so important, especially in this you know sport as well. But I mean, posing, have you changed things up as well? Obviously, with the new added size, you maybe might have been able to, you know, accent a few of your poses better. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was doing some work with a different posing coach uh, a year ago. I started working with him, and so I changed things up with that uh, there in that area. And um, I'm all, I'm always working on my posing. I feel that your posing is it's never like finished. It's always a work in progress, right? Because it's an art form. I mean, exactly like you said, you do, your body changes and your I don't want to say your style changes, but sometimes how you, how you feel, how you come across, it comes across in your posing, like how you present yourself. So, um, yeah, I always try to work on that. Actually, I have to um, go and buy myself a new floor to ceiling mirror because I was posing yesterday morning. And in prep, I don't know, other competitors will attest to this, but you tend to get a little clumsy and 
absent-minded at times. And anyway, long story short, my uh, fancy full-length posing mirror is now in a thousand. Little Did you pieces. walk into it by accident? No, you know, I I moved it against the wall and I moved a chair and it the whole thing just at oh. five a.m. smashed all. Of it. So, yeah, that, that's how you know you're gonna have a good day. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> at seven years apparently. <laughs> Jeez, yeah, that is that that is int- Yeah, that was. Ugh. Yeah, that's yeah. that's definitely a bummer. So where do you where does one even go to buy posing mirrors? First of all, because those those don't seem to be something. I mean, I don't even know if there are stores that like just have them in the aisle. Obviously, it's just a mirror, but like it has to be bigger. Is there is is there any place that like specifically makes mirrors that are designed for that? Or I not that I know of. This was like a big like one for a room from the brick, but um, well, I have them set up back to back, right? So you can like see your back pose like the whole circle yeah i know some people uh, that have like 20 of them like lined up there's like five on the bottom there's five on the top and then they just do it on the other side too where it's like yeah they have them all perfectly so it's like you can see everything yeah. at any place so yeah that'd be awesome i do not have that <laughs> that'd just be more mirrors for me to break <laughs> that well and i'd get weird out too especially like late at night if i accidentally walked in there and you'd see like 20 <laughs> versions of yourself and you'd think that like if you were like i don't know they might just get scared or whatever and think that like someone's behind you or something like that so yeah i've never i've never really been especially like if they'd always have those carnivals where they'd have like that hall of mirrors and stuff like that that would always kind of give me the creeps to be completely honest yeah. myself <laughs> but so yeah again there's there's little you know dilemmas in that as well and yeah, I, I, it's great to see your mentality be, you know, so much better. I mean, I'm not, I don't really remember if you were like super sour the last time I had you on, but it does seem like, yeah, things are, have been getting better for you. And yeah, this is just one sport where you really need to have that, you know, the more positive things can go, the better it is for you. Cause this is already a hard enough sport as it is. And yeah, so I'm, I'm very glad to hear that from you, you know, as well, but just, you know, these upcoming shows where, I mean, you're traveling to Europe, you're doing all that sleep we talked about before i mean it's just so important I, have you been trying to find a way on how you're going to be able to manage your sleep especially with the big time zone difference that you're gonna to have to deal with especially when you get there you know what that i don't know i'm a little bit worried about that so because it's so far and, and so what i'm going to do is i'm going to fly from fort McMurray to vancouver i'm going to stay with family for a couple of days there to just get ready because I, I just want to make the you're I going want... even further away from romania for a couple of days before that <laughs> <laughs> well no I'm like i'm going from vancouver to romania like i wanted to break the trip up because for a few reasons one it's a really long it'd be like 24 to 36 hours i don't want to fly that long for a peak week two i'm afraid they're gonna lose my luggage or be stuck at an airport so i figure you know what break it up as much as possible and that way it's it's easier it's an easier transition on my body um but i am worried about water retention and things like that so um we don't use diuretics for the show so i just don't uh, hopefully that's okay <laughs> that's all it's a lot of flying well i love to bring up stress as well cuz that's one thing that no matter how many people try to like oh, I'm going to have zero stress in my life at all. You're going to have stress. It's just human nature. You cannot be completely stress-free unless you are on some type of drug that obviously I want to ingest then the moment that you find out that you're you know 100% stress-free, but it's just never going to happen. Just talking about your stuff right there gives me just a tad bit of stress myself. How do you like to deal with stress? Because it, people don't understand, especially with how stress affects your body. I mean, it, there's just so many little things, especially in the sport that can have lead to a different outcome. How do you personally like to deal with stress? Because... Like I said before, you are not going to be able to be 100% stress-free no matter how hard you try. No, you're absolutely right. And some stress is good because if you weren't stressed at all, you wouldn't be motivated. Oh, yeah. Like, be- yeah, there are opportunities where, like, yeah, if you're not stressed at all, you're probably a psychopath. But, like, yeah, other yeah. – yeah, yeah. And that's what keeps you focused, right, and gives you drives to a degree. Um, for me, I, I'm a planner. If I'm prepared, then I'm good. I have lists. I take care of everything that I can take care of. The minute that I can take care of it, I don't put anything off. So, like registration for the show, getting the card, like just even the small things. Like I've already booked my hair and makeup and tanning like weeks ago, because it's just one thing I can check off the list, so I don't have to worry about it. So, I started packing already a while ago. <laughs> so that's how I stay on top of things because I find if they pile up, that's when you get overwhelmed, right? And when you get overwhelmed you don't deal with things properly. So I try to just stay like, okay, 
what is it I'm worried about? How can I take care of it? How can I fix it or, or alleviate the stress now so that I'm better prepared later so I don't have to work? So and it's time management, really, I think is what it comes down to. Time management, being prepared, and you have to anticipate um, that things could go sideways sometimes. Like, I, I'm not always the best at being like a cool cucumber type person. Like, uh, when I went to Texas, I did the uh, Texas State show in uh, November, and things didn't go well. And, and I was doing Florida right after that, six days later. So I, I planned too much. I came out of COVID just raring to get, raring to go, um, out the gate, three shows back to back in a matter of weeks. And it was a lot, it was a lot to prepare for. It was a lot to try to keep straight and things weren't going well because I was really stressed out in Texas and, I retained a lot of water. I didn't like my look on stage. And mentally, I had a hard time because I started spiraling. Even though I had another show, I couldn't, like, I just couldn't stay focused. I couldn't clear my head. So that was a huge learning experience for me. Um, I kind of recovered. And at the end of the day, it came out okay. My placings weren't what I wanted them to be. But what I took from that, I'm like, okay, there's a lesson here for me. Don't try to take on too much, first of all. Like, one show at a time you know, um, I think is the way to go. And instead of planning this, 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 it's like, do this, reassess, do this, reassess, because then you're not taking on so much. Um, and then also just being able to like stop for a minute and say, okay, what is it that's chaotic? How can I make it less chaotic instead of mentally spiraling? Like you've got to get control over yourself mentally. So that, that was a big thing for me because I'm like, I, at one point, was a huge basket case during all of that. And I'm like, I thought I was kind of a chill person. I'm like, what's happening here? <laughs> Why am I not chill? So I realized that I, I can lose my chill and that I need to uh, anticipate that things like that could happen and how could I deal with it better in the future. So The moment you said three shows in a row, I was just like, okay, yeah, that's not going to end up. That's not going to end up. I've had probably about one guest that actually had that happen where like they they went through and things seemed to go well, but because yeah, that is. So I hope that you're not going to do that again. Just three shows in a row, because that first of all, even doing two in a row to me is like, as an outsider, just seems like it would be so taxing, especially just with, you know, all the other stuff. But I mean, yeah, it's, it's, you know. This is just a whole sport of trial and error. Like I've said, this podcast really just should be tr- called trial and error because that is the entire aspect of the sport. I mean, you're going to, there's just going to be trials and, and tribulations, but I mean, the sport has changed even in the last two and a half years since I talked to you. It's a sport that's always ever evolving. What have been some of the bigger changes that you've seen in the two and a half years since we last had you on? Uh, you know, it's been interesting because I mean, especially a lot of the big shows uh, were really small. Like I, I didn't compete in New York, but I went. Um, my friend Cass Gillis was competing in Wellness uh, there. So me and Tanya and her went women to New York. I had a great time, but like the New York Pro is a very prestigious show, and it's usually huge. And that was small. The Toronto show was small. Uh, so it's just been a really interesting time since. COVID because I feel like the sport hasn't fully recovered, you know? Um, and then sometimes it's different shows, some of the judging, like the look that they've gone for. I think that they're they sometimes trying to soften it up, sometimes not. So I, I don't know. It's just been an interesting time since pre COVID. I don't feel like things are back at the same consistent level with the, with the athletes, the number of athletes and kind of what they're looking for and everything. So, well, speaking of like consistency, I know with different countries, sometimes they want different looks. Like if you compare the results in Brazil to the results, you know, in the United States or in Canada, or even the results sometimes in Europe, have you done any research about maybe how European judges might differ from judges over here? I don't, I'm not really that familiar with, I mean, I've had a lot of British guests on because, you know, they can speak English and stuff like that. But like, have you done any, like any research on maybe how they might in Europe have different, you know, placings other than maybe they might have over here? I haven't really researched. Like, I, I mean, I look to see who like with Romania, like who won the past shows and what the looks were the, you know, the top like five to 10 girls. Um, 
and 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 a little bit like I looked at the Spain and there was the one in Hungary coming up. So I kind of did a little bit that way, and I just looked at who's the head judge or who potentially. Um, but no, but I, I. But you are right. Like they are judged a bit differently, so it'll be interesting. I'm not sure what to expect at all in when I go to Romania. Like if they're gonna like my look or not like my look. I mean, I can't really worry about it at the end of the day because I am what I am, and if I'm an apple, I have to be an apple and not an orange. So you know, I can only be the best apple I can be. But <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Like it it doesn't really change anything that I would do. My coach, it's in his hands. And actually he's the one that picked Romania because he lives in France. So it will be great because he's going to be there and it'll be actually our, my first time meeting him. And, and it will be, I think the first time I've ever even had a coach at the show with me. So normally I'm on, I'm on my own and we're doing everything kind of over the phone. So this is, I'm super excited about that. I've always found that just be so fascinating, especially like being you being a Canadian, me being an American, where like other than Mexico, really, even just for the United States, there's like no other really countries to even be landlocked to. But then you go to Europe and it's like, yeah, I'll go to Romania. It's like a it's like a, you know, like a five hour drive or something like that for me or something like that. It's like, oh, I'll just take a plane ride that takes like an hour. And you're just like, where can I go from here? I mean, it's like a four hour plane ride for me just to get to New York. And then, you know, so it's I've always just found that fascinating how like especially when you go to countries like that, it's like completely different cultures, completely different ways of life are literally just, you know, hours away from each other as here, whereas opposed to here, it's just a vast land mass where it's just, yeah. Yeah. And did you know, just side note, it was actually, it's cheaper for me to go to Romania and do the, that show than it is. It would have been for me to go to Florida and do the Florida show. Wait, what? Are you serious? Yeah. From here. Even with like the ticket, for, well, even with the ticket prices and all that. So, are you talking about like the show, like paying for the show and like all that stuff added together? Wait, the hotel, yeah. Again, I do think it's because no one really wants to go to Romania right now. That might be a factor. <laughs> that might be a factor in it where they're like, okay, we're willing to give you discounts. Just please come here. I know that there's a war literally right across the border with us, but yeah, so that that might be the case there. But again, it might just be just because you know it it, it might be cheaper, but. Yeah, so that is actually, hey, you know, the more money you can save because like we've talked about a million times on this podcast, this is not a sport that you get into if you want to make money. And if you do think that, I have a timeshare in Florida that I would like to sell to you then because, you know, it seems like it would be a, a good investment for you. But, you know, yeah, it's just yeah, everything with that. And, I mean, a question that I've recently been asking people, and, you know, it just shows how good of a host I am. It took me about 500 episodes to finally, you know, develop this question. But I think this to myself every single time. It's just the human nature in me, no matter, you know, how many times I've talked to a guest or no matter how much I know about them, I still just deep down just think, this, why do they do this to themselves? Why do they put themselves through this? I hear about all these prep brain stories. I hear about all the other stuff. Obviously you're great athletes and you do so much. I mean, it's just the hard work and the dedication is second to none, but just, there's just that little human nature in me. It's like, why do these people do this to do this to themselves? What is your response to that? Cause I bet you still hear that all the time from people like Jennifer, why do you, why do you go through all this? Why do you do all this to yourself? How do you like to respond to that? Because everyone's answer is different. And I, and I think it just shows a wide variety of the appeal of this sport to so many people. I think you just have to, you, you have to love it. I mean, for me, I have a love for it. I love how you can change and manipulate your body. I love the science of with the biology of how your body works, you know, the mechanics of it, the science with the diet and nutrition and just the growth, the physical growth, but the mental growth too, um, you know, even more so the mental growth, right? It's such a, it's such a challenging sport and you learn so much about yourself. It comes with great sacrifice. It really does. So you have to be prepared for that, but, and, and sometimes that's difficult. You know, you, you have to sacrifice, well, other things that you would do financially, like traveling or, you know, whatever, right? But, and, and your time. So you, you miss things with friends and family, social life, and blah, 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 that you would otherwise be doing. But I don't know. I just find that it's so rewarding. Like, it's, like I said, physically and mentally. Um, and I mean, it's not... It's an extreme sport, but if you're doing it correctly, it's healthy. I'm not saying the last couple of weeks of practice the healthiest, <laughs> because it's not. You know, you're you're about yeah. I don't care what anyone says. That skeleton face is not the healthiest look. I'm I'm gonna be completely honest. 
but I mean, it's, I, I feel like it's, it's a, an investment into your physical and your mental well-being. Like, and, and I mean, as you are getting ready to go to that, I mean, you're, you know, a short time away. How do you deal with that last few weeks mentally? Because that is what really separates, you know, the kids from the adults really is just being able to push through on that. Where does that mental toughness come from for you? Because there are so many people that would falter during those last few weeks. And it just takes a special breed of person, in my opinion, just to be able to pull through. But where does that come through for you, you think? I find that it's, uh, I mean, I try to do a lot. I'm going to call it meditation. It's not meditation in the, in the traditional sense of the word where I'm sitting on a pillow in the dark, but, um, but it's my own personal meditation. Like I'll do when I'm doing my cardio or whatever. And I picture my goal and I picture myself achieving that goal and what it means to me and what it, you know, that's where I get my drive from. I see, I try to hone that in on that energy and shut the world out. And it, to be honest, like the last few weeks are definitely physically the most difficult, but I find mentally it's not, it's mentally it's almost the easier part because you're so close to that goal. So you can take all that energy that you have and your why and just drive through. Whereas for me personally, I find Earlier on in the prep, it's like, oh, you've got so much time, and it's so easy, like, oh, I've got so long to go, and then, and then, nothing seems really urgent, or it seems far off, or, you know, I don't want to say not attainable, but it's it's not tangible, like, right, right there in front of you, right? So it's almost easier to falter at that point, but when it's go time, like, I work well under pressure, it's like, okay, it's go time, nothing else matters, how do you, you know, work with, with your heart and that just pushes me through and, and, and I wouldn't even say that's the difficult part. You get tired and you're hungry. Try to be nice to people at that point. <laughs> Sometimes the harder part. I'm not going to lie. I, I did meditation once and I'll, and I'll just quick share you the story of what happened. So I was like, 13 14 and it was before a big game in baseball and we were in the state tournament and I, the night before was just like, just chilling, relaxing. And then I went to bed had a dream and then in the dream, like I was meditating. So I was like, Oh, I'll just try that right before the game. So I meditated for like probably like half an hour. I had a vision where I hit a home run to center field. It would bounce off the top of the fence and then go over. It would be on a two, one count. And the pitcher would throw me a fastball inside on my first step out of the game. So when it got to my first step at in the game, it was a two and one count. The pitcher threw me a fastball that was inside and I hit the ball and it hit the same exact spot in my vision, that same exact part of the fence, hit the top of it and went over. That scared the living hell out of me. So I never wanted to do that ever again. I'm like, I don't need to, I don't need this crap in my life. That it, it was too scary. I was like, that exactly happened. Like there's no way that I would have ever been able to. So I was like, this, I, this is some devil stuff. I don't know what I'm doing right now. So, you know, might as well, you know, I don't want to. So that, that scared me too much where like, I didn't try really meditating really ever again. Cause I was like, okay, I don't know. I don't want to know what's in store for me for the rest of my life then with that. So, you know, again, maybe it was just like the biggest coincidence in history. There have been bigger coincidences of that, but still, it's still really, you know, scared the crap out of me. But we'll ask two questions here before we wrap things up. If someone, I asked you these two before and we'll see if the answers have changed at all. But if someone were to walk up to you and say, you know, Jennifer, we made a decision. You can change one thing about the sport of bodybuilding and everyone would go along with it. What would be one thing that you'd like to see changed? I think I answered this the same way that I'll answer it before that I'll answer it now is that um, I would make it on par with other sports where the athletes monetarily are able to sustain themselves. Yep. I, yeah, that's, I mean, I couldn't have put it better myself, honestly, because yeah, that is ridiculous. And like televise it more, get it more out in the public. I mean, they, these used to be on ESPN and now they have like cornhole games instead. And it's, <laughs> yeah. Don't even get started on that. that. That bodybuilding. I mean, especially lately, in the past couple of years with the diuretics and people. Well, because, yeah, no, especially when most people think about bodybuilding, they're just bombarded with the headlines of all the negative effects of the sport, of like the people dying in the diuretics. Now everyone just has that opinion of like, oh, it's a stupid sport. It's dangerous. You're going to die if you do it just because of that headline. So I think there needs to be a little bit more positive representation of it, too. And it's like, no, there is a healthy way to do it where you aren't, you know, killing yourself, basically. Yeah, 100%. 
100%. And I feel like because, I mean, I don't know the statistics on things, but I feel like there's always been people, a certain percentage of people that have passed away, and there's always going to be people that take things to extreme and pass away because of that in anything. Um, but I feel like possibly because of social media and da, 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 that it gets more attention now. So I don't know if there's actually like an increase in necessarily in deaths, although maybe because the sports got more extreme over time. But I mean, statistically, I don't know how much more dangerous bodybuilding is as compared to football or blah, 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 blah. Like if they both, if bodybuilding has increased exponentially, like, do you know what I'm trying to say? I'm not just, Absolutely. Like, I like to make a comparison. Like, people think of Detroit and they think, like, oh, it's a murder capital. It's like a, it's a horrible place. You're going to get murdered there. If you look at the stats, there's like, what, a 0.0001% chance of you getting murdered there. So it's like, just because of all the bad things, get, especially in the media these days, like, I don't need to go into that because it's a whole rant or whatever. But like, if you're just yeah. shown the negative effects of something, even if they are a minuscule percentage of what actually goes on, you're just going to have that opinion of like, oh yeah. And that's what happened with bodybuilding. That's what also happened in the NFL. That's happened with other sports as well, where if they just focus on some of the negative stories that, you know, are the absolute minority. But yeah, I think a lot of people, yeah, if you actually were to look at the stats of the bodybuilders that like, as opposed to the ones that actually like have health, health risk, it's not as high as most people would say or see. Yeah. And, and if you do look at them, a lot of them, it's because they either have, you know, other health issues before they even start competing or, you know, everyone, there's always going to be that one fluke that happens too. So. Yes, exactly. Or people that aren't, um, cautious yeah. at all. Yeah, a absolutely. It's, yeah. There's always going to be those people that push it to the extreme where you're just like, okay, well, it's not that much of a shocker that they drop dead at the age of 25 because you know, I'm not even going to get into it, but like people know what I'm talking about, but yeah. And, I mean, I'll have you on in a year from now. I don't know why it took two and a half years. Well, actually, I do know because COVID and everything just got, I mean, I had guests now that I haven't had on for like three years that I've been trying to like message and be like, okay, I know it's been like three years and I know I said a year, but like, oh my God, stuff just got really busy here. But I would love to have you on a year from now. I'm writing that down right now to get her back on a year. But where would you like to be at in your career? Where would you like to be at just in your overall life? What are some goals that you'd like to have achieved when we have you back on a year from today? Well, I'm hoping that... um you know, I like the changes that I've made since the last one we talked. I like, I'm very happy with everything. So I want to continue to make more, uh, I don't say drastic, it's not the right word, but um, more pronounced changes and improvements and the Olympia qualifying. So, yeah. I and I can't wait to see what the changes. I mean, if this has been two and a half years change, I don't know what it's going to look like in a year. But hey, we'll we'll see what happens. But again, you know, Jennifer, I cannot thank you enough for coming back on and giving us an update. I really appreciate it, and I wish you nothing but the best. And I look forward to seeing how you do in Romania. Awesome! It was my pleasure. It was so good to catch up. And hey, that's that's the main part of why I do this. But again, everyone, thank you so much. And this is Ryan Johnson, DD on the spot, signing off. Have a great day, everyone.